So it's now my pleasure to invite up uh, a senior person, and not by that I don't mean senior citizen, oh, yeah, I think he's, he's approaching that. Uh, Jerry Gosso is the longest serving member of Search and Rescue, our Search and Rescue team. Uh, he's been on the, so our team's existed for 20 years, and Jerry's been on the team for 19 of those 20 years. He's probably the most dedicated, committed member of our team. The hours he puts in is incredible. Uh, I have the, the distinct pleasure of having driven to a number of searches with him and actually wrote an article called Driving with Miss Jerry. Uh, if you Google it on uh, the internet, you'll, I'm sure you can find it. It's very entertaining. Uh, so I'd like to invite Jerry. Jerry's also, because he's a long longest serving member, he is also our team historian. So Jerry's going to come up and share a few, uh, few memories. Jerry? <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. I will get you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. In his book, Deadly Frontiers, Dean Beebe has written that Canada occupies a unique position in the rarefied world of search and rescue. The second largest country on the planet, Canada has three jagged coastlines, an immense internal wilderness, and a vast Arctic to swallow hapless travelers. At the same time, Canada is among the most thinly populated regions on Earth. With minimal state support, Canada's search and rescue communities have been forced to make the most of inadequate resources and equipment across broad seas, forests, and tundra. The result, miraculously, has been a tightly focused, efficient, and effective culture of search and rescue that has much to teach the world. Ce soir, je voudrais raconter l'histoire et comment ce groupe a vu le jour et fournir des commentaires sur son histoire. As has been mentioned, volunteers are an important part of Canada's SAR community. Many of Canada's 300 SAR groups came into existence because of tragedy. The origin of SAR Global One is exceptional only in that its origin came out of two tragedies. The second began on November 11, 1995. Chris Brown, a 26-year-old hunter from Wakefield, went missing near Otter Lake in the Pontiac area of Western Quebec. A week-long search was organized by the Sûreté de Québec, during which 150 well-intentioned but untrained volunteers participated. From 10 degrees and rain on November 11th, winter arrived quickly with 30 centimeters of snow and a 20-degree drop in temperature. Unfortunately, no trace was found until two years later. On October 11, 1997, Chris's remains were discovered 10 kilometers from the position last seen. Chris Brown was the first tragedy. The second involved 22-year-old Rick Gray, who was the son of Beverly Pick. Rick disappeared while hiking near Gold River on Vancouver Island in early 1994. Rick was not reported missing for two weeks, and the police search lasted four days. His mother, Beverly, left her home in West Quebec to search for her son. She stayed in BC for a year and a half, working as general manager for a private SAR group. The follow-up searches for Rick, unfortunately, were inconclusive, although it appears likely that he fell through the ice and drowned. In November 1995, just before the Chris Brown search. Bev had recently returned to West Quebec, and she was one of the people who responded to the uh, request to search. After the SQ stood down in the fall of 1995, the volunteers, coordinated by Bev, continued to search for Chris Brown. Bev understood more than anyone that while police services must focus on the living, the families of missing persons long for closure. Following the Chris Brown search, Bev and others recognized the need for trained volunteers to assist the police, and the idea of SAR Global One, now SBOOB SAR, was born. In January 1996, Bev began a training program for those interested in learning about SAR and joining the group. Le 8 août 1986, SAR Global, Global One a été constitué comme organisme sans but lucratif federal ayant son siège social à la pêche au Québec. Bientôt, il a formé un partenariat avec la police de la municipalité originale des collines des Outaouais, 
ce partenariat continue à ce jour. Quelques années plus tard, le groupe a décidé de tendre de l'ouest du Québec à l'est ontarien, alors que cet grand territoire a parfois été un défi. Il a aussi entraîné l'accès à un plus grand bassin de recrues potentiels et d'autres sources d'appui. Le groupe a également reçu l'appui des deux provinces et les deux organisations bénévoles provinciales. Comme déjà mentionné, une des choses uniques de SBO Obisar est sa capacité à travailler au Québec et en Ontario dans les deux langues officielles pour plusieurs agences, y compris les services de la police locale, régionale et provinciale, ainsi que les autorités autochtones. SBO Obisar a profité des connaissances, expériences, inspirations et des camaraderies de la communauté de recherche et sauvetage de partout au pays. In its brief history, hundreds of people have participated in this group as members and thousands have benefited from its existence through searches, preventative SAR training, and on occasion, assistance to civil authorities, such as the 1998 ice storm, the 2011 Richelieu floods, and the boil water advisories. Over the years, there have been close to 100 calls for assistance. They've come during every month of the year and every hour of the day. These calls have included over half of the 40 lost person profiles documented by Robert Kester, ranging from abductions to troubled adolescents, dementia to despondence, hikers to hunters, mushroom gatherers to snowshoers. The impacts of SBO OBSAR on members and non-members is sometimes difficult to quantify. The skills learned are both technical, such as first aid, survival, navigation, communications, and also leadership, helping to prevent problems in the backcountry and being able to take charge in emergency situations. Sometimes the impact is as obvious as the tears of thanks that we receive when we have successful searches, even when the successful search brings closure to a family rather than a happy ending. At other times, the impacts may come months or years later, after a hug -a tree presentation in the form of a call from a scout leader saying, we lost a few, they stayed put, they hugged trees, they waited to be saved, and they were. In looking back over the history of this organization, it is heartening to see how many of the dreams of the visionary pioneers have already come true. The group has grown, increased its capabilities, and is becoming a center of volunteer SAR expertise. Thank you all for your support and for sharing this event with us tonight. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, I can very much attest to the, the reference to the, the late night calls with search and rescue. I can't tell you how many times I've been woken by Jerry at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, with a call where Jerry just calls and the only voice on the phone is, do you want to go for a walk in the woods? <laughs> That's how I used to get called out. Uh, so thank you, Jerry. Um, I also want to recognize, I mean, we are one uh, among hundreds of teams across the country, volunteer teams across the country and volunteer associations. So I want to make reference to some of the key players from our perspective in the volunteer community. Uh, SARBAC, Search and Rescue Volunteer Association of Canada, is a key uh, national leader in the volunteer ground search and rescue community. The Ontario Search and Rescue Volunteer Association, the Association Québécoise Bénévole de Recherche et Sauvetage, uh, we want to recognize uh, Thousand Islands uh, Ground Search and Rescue Team for sitting in the back. Thank you for coming out. Um, and also recognize uh, members of the National Search and Rescue Secretariat who came to join.